grip on society. What are some of the compound effects that we don't talk about? Yeah, good. These are good questions. Thank um, you, Judge. <laughs> and your listeners should know we didn't talk about these questions. Yeah. But, you know, the popular misconception about the mob is that they're, they do gambling and loan sharking. Yeah. And, and so they even say prostitution. Yeah. Mob prostitution. Yeah. But they also, they don't make their money with that. John Gotti's crew did, but yeah. the Ambino family made its money through labor racketeering. Correct. And I just choose one industry to give you the example. You can't get a truck on a construction site in Manhattan unless the on-site steward for the Teamsters Union, Local 282, lets the truck in. Yeah. If, the, if that guy decides not to let the truck in, mm. an hour, two hours, costs millions of dollars. The very intricate construction yeah. plans, right? Yeah. So if you're a, a, an owner or a construction manager, you know that's there. So maybe you're going to let the you're going to give the drywall contract or the rebar contract yeah. to the to the company that's with the wise guys. Yeah. So for decades, for every yard of concrete poured in every major construction site in Manhattan, three dollars a yard went to the mob. One to the Gambino family. One to the Genovese family, headed by Chin Giganti, and the other to the corrupt union official in charge of Local 282 of the Teamsters. Wow. That's how they make their money, yeah. millions of dollars over short periods of time. Yeah. And then you look at the peers, same yeah. deal, garbage carting. Cabot Center, yeah. Center. You know, it's like it, people didn't understand what a parasite the mob was on all sectors of the economy in New York. That's how they made their money. Now, you as a prosecutor, and, you know, you obviously had a different lens, but, you know, respectfully, and your book is is going to be a bestseller if it's not already, I know it just came out, and, and we'll put some links below. You got to read it. I'm halfway through, and it's a real deal. Um, but being in the same courtroom as John Gotti, being in his presence, how did that feel like, Judge? Well, look, I I was a kid. My, that first trial was seven months. Yeah. So, you know, and I, I was sheltered. Yeah. And, you know, the, the trial got really acrimonious in the defense case when they called the witness who accused me and my wife of like suborning perjury by dealing drugs. <laughs> so then I would talk to them in, in, during breaks in yeah. the court. And we actually kind of got along. You know, he yeah. he acted the whole case as though he was going to win the case. And the, we found out almost five years later why he was acting that way. Yeah. You know, we, t we talked about our witnesses. We talked about the tapes. Yeah. And about Willie Boy Johnson and yeah. who revealed to be an informant yep. who was going to get and did get whacked. Um, so that was, it was pretty, you know, for a young, you know, a young guy, it was a kind of an interesting experience. As I say, it got really bad when, once they started accusing me and Diane, my co-prosecutor of crimes. Thanks. Um, so, OK, so obviously you lose that trial unfairly and we find out later why. But just and again, I don't want to give too much away or I don't. But 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 the the last trial where you got him, where Sammy flipped. Like, and they, you know, he said if Bailey came and is unwinnable and through like my research and, and reading some of the book and just kind of like just doing some research and talking to some former street guys, um, Gotti had a chance if, if Gravano doesn't flip. Give us your kind of thought. And obviously my lawyer always has when I hates when I say the word if, and I know lawyers hate if, but if Sammy doesn't flip, that wasn't a lay of that case. If you can kind of walk through that. Sure. Look, we, we indicted. Administration, the boss, underboss, Consulier, Gotti, Ano, Lacasio, based on tapes from the secret apartment above the Ravenite. Correct. Obviously, I'm lead prosecutor. I think I'm going to win that case. But then Sammy flips. Before he flipped, our concerns, my concern, was that the case had no depth. I didn't have any accomplice. All I had were tapes. Yeah. The good side is you can't cross a tape. Correct. The the bad side was it has it uh, it lacks depth, and there was a way that if John Gotti were not the egomaniac that he was, there was a way he could have said to the his lawyer could have said to the jury, 
look, I took responsibility for this stuff, but Gravano was out of control. It was yeah. really, and, you know, and once Gravano, so short answer is I was confident we'd convict these guys on the tapes alone. But when Gravano flipped it, it made what I thought was a strong case, a truly suffocating case, because it allowed me, at the end of the case, I stood up in front of the jury and said, tapes alone, he's guilty. Wow. Gravano alone, he's guilty. Tapes plus Gravano, we're really looking to the rest of the mob, like it's over for John Gotti. That was my pitch. Wow. And and with that said is, um, not to get too much in the weeds, but how did the strategy change? So obviously with Gravano is a great asset, you have the tapes, you had a strategy going in. What was the strategic shift with Gravano more than just having Gravano? Because, you, you know, it's easy to say, well, I have Gravano. No, no, not that simple. You guys probably wargamed it uh, 20 ways a Sunday. So how did your strategy shift as a team as lead to get Gotti after Gravano flipped? Yeah, it shifted dramatically. Yeah. Because it's easy to present tapes. Correct. One thing Gravano really added to our case was, was – you know, the, the centerpiece of our case was this spectacular murder of George, of uh, Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti. That's and truth be told, John Gotti admitted murders on our tapes, but he denied three times killing Castellano 